In this second part of the lecture, we're going to talk about antibiotics and vaccines. Antibiotics are another weapon that has been incredibly effective in fighting infectious disease. Everyone is familiar with antibiotics, but today you're going to learn the details of how they work. Antibiotics are chemicals used to target one type of organism selectively. They are often produced by bacteria, fungi, or plants and have selective toxicity, meaning they only harm bacteria and not the host. Each antibiotic will have a specific cellular target. Three major classes of antibiotics are prescribed today. Beta-lactam antibiotics, such as ampicillin, that target bacterial cell walls, fluoroquinolones, that target DNA structure and replication, and macrolides, that target protein synthesis. Together, these three classes of antibiotics account for 96% of all antibiotics prescribed to treat infections. And these are the three classes that we will talk about. We have covered beta-lactam antibiotics in previous lectures, but just as a reminder, they inhibit the transpeptidation step of cell wall synthesis in bacteria that have peptidoglycan. This weakens the cell walls of susceptible bacteria eventually causing them to lice. Drugs like amoxicillin and penicillin are only effective against growing cells. Note that there are also a number of different classes of drugs that attack cell wall synthesis, but are not beta-lactam antibiotics. For example, bacitracin, cycloserine, and vancomycin. Antibiotics that target DNA replication do so by inhibiting topoisomerases. For example, DNA gyrase. These enzymes are important for maintaining the supercoiling of the DNA. Supercoiled DNA is important for maintaining its structure, and if not a proper structure is maintained, it will interfere with DNA replication. The most common topoisomerase inhibitors in use are fluoroquinolones, such as ciprofloxacin. There are also other classes such as quinolones and novobiosin. Finally, there are inhibitors of translation. A large collection of antibiotics in use today inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. You may find this odd, if you think about it, because all living things have ribosomes. How come these antibiotics don't target eukaryotic ribosomes? It turns out that there are enough structural differences between our ribosomes and those of bacteria that these drugs have a selective toxicity. The most often prescribed class of antibiotics that inhibit ribosomes are the macrolide antibiotics. These drugs are thought to inhibit the transfer of the growing peptide chain to the newly inserted tRNA. Go back and look at translation if that sentence didn't make any sense. Shown at right is the structure of azithromycin, one of the most commonly prescribed macrolide antibiotics. So here's a group discussion for you. How do you determine what antibiotic to use against an illness? The best way to determine this is by exposing the pathogen to antibiotics and see which ones inhibit it. There's two ways that are class, this is classically done. One is the minimum inhibitory concentration test where you dilute out an antibiotic to the low, you know, and less and less amounts and see what amount will inhibit the microbe. A more common test is the Kirby Bauer disc diffusion test, where you put a disc on a plate and then you let the antibiotic spread out and you can see which ones inhibit the microorganism. In many cases, these kind of tests are not done because physicians are already familiar with the pathogens that happen to be circulating in the area and the recommended ways to treat them. A growing concern with antibiotics is their overuse. This can be from an inappropriate prescription. Someone comes down with a virus, a flu, a cold, and wants an antibiotic. Antibiotics do not inhibit viruses, so they're pointless to use in dousing yourself with antibiotics increases the chances of resistance. 
There is the use in agriculture. It's been found that giving feed animals low concentrations of antibiotics will often promote their growth. While this is true, it can also increase antibiotic resistance. There is in use of animal hobbies, such as in aquariums for fish. When people don't want to clean out their aquarium to keep their fish healthy, they'll use an antibiotic. Finally, there are relaxed regulations in some countries. In some places, you can buy antibiotics over the counter, which I think should not be true in any case. So why is using too many antibiotics a problem? Because it puts a selective pressure on the microorganisms. If you imagine you have a population of microorganisms, and this is a pathogen that causes a disease, if there's not inappropriate use of antibiotics, the number of organisms that are resistant to that antibiotic stays reasonably low. If, however, you increase the use of antibiotics, this is going to select for this antibiotic resistant strain and increase its number in the population. Eventually, all of this pathogens will become resistant to an antibiotic if it's overused too much. How do pathogens become resistant to antibiotics? First of all, there are mechanisms of temporary resistance to antibiotics. The microbe may not be growing. A lot of the time, an antibiotic is, needs the microbe to grow to be able to kill it. The microbe may be growing in a location that is not easily accessible. Finally, the microbe may be growing in a biofilm, and this is shown on the slide at the bottom. <clears throat> and it's showing a biofilm, a bladder pod of E. coli. So this is E. coli growing in the bladder in a biofilm, and this will protect it from treatments with antibiotics, or will slow the effect of antibiotics. These tend to be temporary and after a amount of time, sometimes treatments will kill these organisms. Once an organism starts growing, it moves to a different location or you use a different antibiotic to get to locations or you break up a biofilm, then the antibiotic is effective. Another problem that you can have in antibiotic resistance is acquired resistance. And this can happen via horizontal gene transfer, conjugation transformation or transduction, or by mutation of the organism. An example of horizontal gene transfer is the R100 plasmid that spreads in gram-negative bacteria. This is a plasmid of around 100 KB. It has a number of different resistances on it. It has mercury, sulfonylamide, streptomycin, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline resistance. As this plasmid spreads through the population, it makes the organism resistant to these drugs. So what is going on in what kind of genes or drugs or enzymes are being made that cause antibiotic resistance? Well, first of all, you can reduce the permeability of a cell to an antibiotic. If you alter porins that the antibiotic cannot come through the gram-negative cell wall, the outer membrane, it can stop it. If a capsule changes so that it now repels an antibiotic, you can become resistant. You can also inactivate an antibiotic. Many organisms that are resistant to penicillin or beta-lactam antibiotics have a beta-lactamase. This beta-lactamase will actually split the beta-lactam ring and make the antibiotic no longer effective. You can also alter the target Resistance to rifampicin is based on a mutation in the beta prime subunit of RNA polymerase. That changes it so that the antibiotic can no longer bind. And finally, efflux pumps. Efflux pumps will sometimes be increased in expression and they will pump the antibiotic out of the cell. So how can we combat this antibiotic resistance? One of the things you can do is develop new drugs to replace the old drugs that the bacteria are resistant to. However, with this kind of strategy, they're still gonna have a limited life 
because microorganisms always seem to be able to overcome any kind of drug we create. Another thing we can do is focus on narrow spectrum antibiotics. If an antibiotic is used just to treat one organism, then only that organism has an opportunity to become resistant to it, not this whole collection of microbes, and then they can pass that organism to the species that you're trying to combat. So narrow spectrum is better. Also, narrow spectrum is good because it doesn't affect your microbiome as much. Prudent use of antibiotics is definitely something we should do. This decreases the selective pressure for resistance, and that will then decrease the incidence of risk resistance in the population. There's been a number of studies that have shown that when you quit using an antibiotic, the number of resistance organisms decrease because it seems they're not as fit as the normal pathogen in the environment. A second thing you can do is a combination therapy where you use two drugs. Then the microorganism has to be resistant to both of those drugs, and that can eliminate the occurrence of resistance because at least one of them will kill the organism and then the resistance doesn't live on. Surveillance. So if we take extra measures when dealing with resistant strains and we're aware of where they're popping up and we adjust the drugs that we're doing using, we can eliminate or decrease the incidence of these resistant organisms in the environment. Infection prevention is always a good idea. If people don't get sick with an infection, then you don't have to use a drug to treat it. Finally, there can be also infection control by other methods and one of the big advantages of these is they are very narrow range. One thing that's under active development right now is bacteriophage. You can isolate viruses against every pathogen that's known. If you keep these available and then when someone gets an infection you treat them with the virus, that bacteriophage kills the pathogen and it kills it selectively leaving everything else alone. I think that bacteriophage therapy will become a significant treatment in the future. Bactericins are another way of treating these infections, and these are compounds, again, produced by microorganisms. They are proteins, and these proteins will be very specific in disrupting the membrane of only certain organisms. Many are from lactic acid bacteria, and they are very safe. Our final topic in public health is the use of vaccines to prevent disease. There are three classes of vaccines. One is live attenuated strains. This is a replicating strain but has defects so it can't cause as significant of a disease or it doesn't cause disease at all but it still raises immune, an immune response. The influenza virus in some cases, measles, mumps, and rubella are examples of these types of vaccines. A dead virus or bacteria can also be used. The advantage to this is it's a little bit safer and you don't have to worry about the microorganism or the virus changing and then becoming more virulent. The disadvantage is, is if cell mediated immunity is needed for the response, you require more doses and it's, they're generally not as effective. Examples are, again, viruses, polio, rabies, hepatitis A, some vi influenza viruses, uh, bacteria, pertussis, and cholera. And finally, there are component vaccines. These are not whole cells or virions. They will be a part of a pathogen, especially one that raises a strong immune response. Subunit vaccines are done, and these are protein subunits of a virus or bacterium. Examples are hepatitis B and anthrax. Toxoids can also be used. These are modified or inactivated toxins, and they will then, exposing a uh, human to these, they will raise antibodies against it, and that will inactivate the toxin. This is how diphtheria and tetanus are treated. One disadvantage of these is the immunity is not lifelong and you have to get constant boosters. That's just why you have to get a tetanus booster. Actually, now it's a diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis booster every 10 years. 
There are also polysaccharide vaccines, and these are to capsular polysaccharides. There's a pneumococcal vaccine against Streptococcus pneumoniae and a Haemophilus B or Hib vaccine that's used. Often adjuvants are added to vaccines to boost the immunogenicity and effectiveness. This is especially required for acellular and recombinant vaccines as these component vaccines are. Things that are used are things like alum or MPL derivatives of Salmonella LPS, and MPL means monophosphorolipid A, and molecular patterns that are found in pathogens and they'll raise a response. Okay, group discussion. Basically, here's an, um, another tip for you in work, studying for this. Make a table. What are the three types of vaccines we talked about? Explain how each raisin is effective immune response without causing disease. So you can see I filled out the first one there, and I want you to fill out the other two. Now that you've had a chance to fill it out, here are the answers as I see them. You can take a look at this, compare them to the answers that you got, and go from there. Vaccines are a challenge for public health. And the important thing is you've got to get about 90 to 95% of the population vaccinated for it to eliminate a disease in a group. Education about getting the vaccines is key. If you Google vaccines are bad, you will get 28.3 million pages on the internet. And that while the internet is wonderful and that it gives you all sorts of information available at your fingertips, it also gives you a lot of wrong information available at your fingertips. We have to fight this. So whose responsibility is it? Public health officials have to be very clear in the benefits of vaccines. Healthcare providers have to be very clear. The media has to also be clear about this. And you, you have to be an advocate for vaccination. I think the COVID-19 epidemic is going to make this easier because it makes it very clear to everyone how important vaccination and immunity is to prevent the spread of serious illness. So imagine you are a parent and your two-month-old is going for their first set of shots. You have heard about the hazards of vaccination. Do you vaccinate and why? Here is the schedule and you can see there's lots of vaccines that children have to get and it's no fun to watch your baby get poked. But vaccines work. Here is a table showing the pre-vaccination rates and then what the results were after vaccines became available. For smallpox, there were 48,164 cases per year. In 2001, there were none. Another one is measles. There are 503,282 cases of measles pre-vaccination every year. In 2001, there were only 108. And you can see there's gigantic reductions in the incidence of these diseases. Vaccines work. Another thing that's really important is herd immunity. It's important in understanding epidemics. Protected individuals protect the rest of the population. Another important concept is herd immunity. It's important in controlling epidemics. Protected individuals protect the rest of this population. What we're looking at right now in the COVID-19 epidemic is that everyone is susceptible to it. So if you have an infected person, they can spread it to everyone in the population. If on the other hand, you can vaccinate against an illness and all the people in yellow here are immune to the illness, it becomes much more difficult for an infected individual to spread a disease with through, throughout a population. And that is why it's so important that everyone get vaccinated. A perfect example of this or the failures of not vaccinating people is the measles outbreak in Europe. 41,000 children were infected and there were 37 deaths, all because of ignorance. 
there were large enough populations that had decided not to vaccinate their children that measles was once again able to spread through a population and 37 people died. We need to vaccinate. Okay, that is it for this class. Thank you guys. It was great. I might do one more video just to sum things up, but this is what you're required to know for the course. Take care.